Good afternoon. It's Thursday, the 16th of February, 2017, just after one o'clock. Welcome to UK Column News. I'm your host, Brian Gerrish, with me in the studio, Mike Robinson. Um, we are delighted to be joined today by David Ellis from Strategic Defence Initiatives. And we're going to be delving deeper into uh, what we say is treason behind the Conservatives' policy on defence. Uh, but vaccinations um, important in the news, and we've got some pretty extraordinary stuff unfolding as a result of the screening of the vaxxed film. Absolutely. So uh, the mainstream media reaction, perhaps, uh, as to be expected. Um, this was the front page of The Times today. U.S. delivers ultimatum over NATO spending. We'll be talking about that later. But the, in the, on the right hand side there, disgraced MMR fraud doctor back in the UK. Nice. Nice. Personal attack. Yes. And uh, here we are. MMR fraud doctor's film was shown under cloak of secrecy. This is both cases, the Times, uh, one the, the uh, newspaper, the other uh, the uh, website. Early on the evening of Valentine's Day, the message went out to 350 ticket holders. Meet us in Regent's Park two hours from now. The audience piled into the hall in the ivy-clad campus of a private university for an event so secretive that not even the host institution was aware of what was about to take place. The organisers had taken the kind of precautions normally used to protect Holocaust deniers or Salafist hate preachers, yet the headline act was no David Irving or Abu Hamza, it was a struck-off doctor. So this is the type of language that uh, the Times choosing to use. Uh, associating uh, Andrew Wakefield with David Irving, with Abu Hamza, with Holocaust denial, with uh, conspiracy theory. Um, so I'm just wondering if someone is so scared of what uh, Andrew Wakefield has to say that they need to tie him to these things. Um, this is another act of sheer desperation from the mainstream press. So who is it that's written this diatribe, both on the website and uh, on the front page uh, of the newspaper itself? It was Oliver Moody. Moody, sorry, Oliver Moody. Um, I mean, this guy is in his what mid twenties or something. hasn't got a clue. He started in the in the Times in twenty eleven. Uh, last year was uh, upgraded from a, a leader's writer to being the science correspondent. Uh, and he describes and he says si he describes himself as a science correspondent at the Times. Uh, opinions here are my uh, are mostly my father's, uh, and he is wondering. Is he the love child of George Osborne and Peter Mandelson? That's how he seems to describe himself. So it's quite bizarre, isn't it? You, you, it's interesting going to people's Twitter pages because you see all sorts of things, but we're not quite sure what this young man is on. But what has he done, I would say, an O level in science? Or is he got a degree somewhere, possibly? Uh, don't know. Don't know. So this is the second job he's had at the Times since his graduation. Um, we have, got, have to ask, what does he know? Uh, and even if he doesn't agree with uh, Andrew Wakefield, what's he doing to defend Andrew Wakefield's right to free speech? That's what I want to know. Clearly, he's not doing anything. Uh, and uh, so when we look at Oliver Moody's other articles, uh, he's clearly no more than an uncritical, well, he's clear to me, and he's no more than an uncritical mouthpiece for the industry. So um, I think perhaps uh, Mr. Moody should, instead of simply attacking the people promoting Andrew Wakefield's work, he should perhaps series, uh, publish a series of articles on the peer-reviewed science which disproves what Wakefield is saying. Uh, can't he do that? Would that not be a reasonable thing to do? I suppose the only option, since he can't do that, uh, is the, pick, the personal attacks, the fake news, and the downright lies. So as for the... Uh, organization it's or the uh, university itself it was Regents University in London what did they have to say uh, they said that the reported content of the film is against all of Regents University London's values and we've taken the decision to immediately terminate our relationship with the organization which screened the film now that organization was using uh, Regents University London to run its courses and was providing degree accredited courses uh, Regents University has also apparently uh, removed the right of that organization to, to give degrees for the courses that they run. Uh, but what I find particularly disconcerting about this statement from the university is that they say the reported content of the film, in other words, from what I'm reading of that, they have not seen the film themselves. And if they haven't seen the film themselves, how can they make a comment or how can they make a decision on the veracity of uh, or the, legitim the legitimacy of the content? This seems 
disingenuous at best. There's thought crime creeping in. Okay, so let's look at uh, just a couple of the other articles. Well, The Sun, that's another Murdoch rag, so perhaps we shouldn't be surprised. Uh, bit of a needle, bit of needle. Who is Andrew Wakefield and what is Vax? Doctor Who made the fraudulent link between MMR vaccine and autism returns for film release. So, so here we are, The Sun making a fraudulent claim about the research. Uh, this is more fake news. Uh, the Telegraph disgraced anti-MMR vaccine doctor Andrew Wakefield gets invitation to university in London. And so it goes on. Um, so um, I'm just going to remind everybody, here is the Vaxxed website, Vaxxed the movie. This has got nothing to do at the end of the day with whether you agree with the content or not. I personally agree with the content. I think it's well researched. There, there is a lot of evidence in the documentary. I have I think many is, questions uh, to be answered. This is the key point. Uh, but the bottom line here for everybody, whether you agree with this content or not, is do we live in a country which, uh, where, we have, where we can apply free speech or do we not? Do we live in a dictatorship or do we not? Uh, this is about the right to say what you believe, what you think, and put it out for peer review. Uh, and uh, this is being denied in too many cases. Um, so let's uh, look at what else has been going on around this issue. Because yesterday, uh, Robert Kennedy Jr. Jr. and others uh, at the uh, press club in the United States made it clear, uh, very clear, by the way, that they're not anti-vaccination, despite this headline in Vox. The headline is Robert De Niro and RFK Jr. have joined forces to push vaccine nonsense. Uh, and the sub headline is the anti-vaxxers are having a moment right now. So, so it's all about anti-vaxxers. They made it absolutely clear in the press conference that they are not anti-vaccine, anti-vaccination. They're anti-vaccination damage. And that's a different thing because uh, what the allegation is that the vaccinations are damaging children. There's a significant difference there. Um, and uh, they are, of course, anti the destruction of a whole generation of children in the name of corporate profits. So Wakefield himself makes this clear at the end of the vaxxed film that this has nothing to do with being anti-vaccination as an ideology. It's about the science. It's about the uh, fact that children, or the claim that children are being damaged by the vaccinations. And it's about stopping corporate interests from silencing dissent, if you want to put it that way. So uh, the press conference yesterday, what, what was interesting about it was that the journalists that were there uh, were challenged quite clearly. Uh, they were challenged to be objective about this subject. They were challenged to look at the evidence and present the evidence in a balanced way. Uh, sadly, it looks like no one's taken up uh, that challenge. This Vox article is uh, typical of that. So let's label it as it is. Fake news. It's all fake news. Uh, I have no compunction to put a slap of fake news label on it. Um, and, uh, you know, when the mainstream media stops attacking individuals, and starts attacking the science uh, and, and justifying their claims, then perhaps they might have a bit more credibility. And in the meantime, while people are switching off from the mainstream media in their droves, well, they deserve to go out of business if they keep pushing this kind of nonsense. Yeah. Well, um, when we were talking just before we went live, um, David Ellis described it, I think, as academic censorship. Um, David, we're, we're getting into a pretty... Uh, pretty dangerous ground now where we can see the state via the media dictating what we're allowed to say and think and believe. Quite. Yeah, as I said, this is nothing but academic sanctions here. And, you know, the amount of fuss that this doctor has, has reaped from voicing concerns about, you know, the, 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 you know, what he was seeing from his point of view and the, and the reaction was so austere. It's got to say, you know, it's got to say, you know, there's, there's, something, there's something frankly not right about this at all. And it needs looking at and scrutinising properly, as, you, you, as I agree with what you've said there, Mike, from a scientific perspective. But all the while that the interests are being clouded, um, you know, are we really going to get some firm foundation to know exactly actually what's really going on here? And is there a danger to our children? You know, that's that's the, that's the bottom line. So, well, don't like it, don't like it at all. If I if I can just come back in there, of course, this is one of the key uh, key things about this whole case is the evidence that children are being damaged. We would have thought that uh, the government, hospitals, many other institutions would be desperate to do proper research to find out why why the number of children who are being damaged, why why this is happening. 
But the answer is all of a sudden we're not interested in the statistics that children are being seriously damaged. So just ignore all that, close it down. We don't want to talk about vaccines. Well, um, a man who follows along that pattern is Mr. Streeter, local Conservative MP for South West Devon area, happens to be my MP. Now, basically, we're just recapping here. I don't want to go into it in great detail, uh, but we challenged Mr. Streeter over reports in The Times and The Telegraph, which were saying Britain's armed forces, particularly the Royal Navy, in a perilous state. He didn't want to answer. Uh, what he did is came back with a personal attack. And uh, he said that uh, he's learned over 20 years not to take any of my comments on any subject seriously. Uh, but of course, this is not just uh, Mr. Streeter, because uh, we know, David, you're picking up the Conservative MPs at the moment, simply refusing to comment on defence. Uh, but I'll just add that uh, later yesterday afternoon, Mr. Streeter came back to me. Now, I challenged him by sending another email. I'm putting it on screen. So if anybody wants to freeze the screen, there's no ifs or buts. You can see exactly what I said to him. But the meat of it was that in his reply, he was making no comment on the questions I asked him about reports in two mainstream papers. So there was no theory. There was no comments. I had asked him for a proper reply on what the two papers were saying. Sorry, if I pop this one on the uh, uh, mic. Uh, we just bring in this. This is what he finally came back with. I have no intention of engaging with you further on this or any other subject. You have brought this upon yourself. It sounds like a head teacher talking, doesn't it? I'm a naughty little schoolboy, and he's not. Uh, I've brought this upon myself by my unacceptable conduct over many years. I'd like to challenge Mr. Street on what he thinks my unacceptable conduct is. But I think that's daring to ask him a question that he doesn't want to answer. So, David, bring you in. Why are these MPs so scared to talk about defence? Well, there's a crisis within the Conservative Party as a whole. And the crisis then amongst the, the, the good folk of Great Britain, United Kingdom. The controlling faction at the top of the Tory party, uh, the problem there isn't the EU. There's no problem with the EU whatsoever, because you can see that within May's cabinet. You know, they're pretty much all, you know, died in the blood, confirmed in it. The problem is EU military union. That's the crisis. They cannot talk about it. They will not talk about it. They refuse to engage on the subject. Uh, and I found this over over a great many years now, trying to interact with them and do it on a logical basis and a professional basis. And I've got to say that the reaction you've got here from Mr. Streeter exactly mirrors what we found. Absolutely, completely. They do not want to talk about it. They cannot talk about it. They will not talk about it. They're going to refuse to talk about EU defence, UK defence and managing it on a, on a military union basis because they know damn well put to the electorate air properly, it will cost them the general election. They would not sustain this at the ballot box by putting it to the British people. Do you want to go into military union, which would effectively mean once it's once the lids off it, surrendering our military now to Europe under European management, both budgetary and policy and and then this is the kicker, all of the industry that goes with it will all have to go into the hat and the nuclear weapons. So it's not just about some EU army as it's been sort of bannered. It isn't. It's a very, very big, nasty monster. Now, this battle has been going on in the Tory party now since 1957, when they first started the process. So even if some of these MPs are unaware of it, as soon as they pick up the phone, I've got somebody here talking about defence. Look, you're an officer. So you've got to say, Brian, you've, you, you are getting exactly the same treatment uh, as Major General Julian Thompson, Admiral Sandy Woodward and all the rest of them that have tried to do this, uh, you know, back in 2010, when the when the when the devastation of our military took place, when it really did turn the corner. That you're getting the same party line, that these people will go through their command chain back to the Tory party CCHQ and you will get this. It's a non, you know, and they've they've duped the public with this nonsense of. There are no votes in defence. What it actually means is there are no votes in Britain for EU military union or EU defence. That's the bottom line. 
Right, David, thank you for that. And I, th I think we're allowed to say that um, my tweet um, that I pushed out with that detail yesterday about Mr. Streeter was picked up by some of the uh, more senior retired people. And uh, if I've got this right, you, you had seen that uh, the tweet was circulating. So it hasn't just lain there. It appears that uh, more senior people have picked up on this. Is that correct? That's absolutely correct. Yeah, absolutely correct. Um, and what we're seeing is that this goes back to my first comment when we first did a taped interview together, you and I, that it was a pleasure to be with somebody that wanted to talk about British defence. And what we've all got to accept is these conservative, conservative MPs, whether they personally want to or don't want to, they are under instructions under their hierarchy and command chain, which is very efficient, and very effective. They are not going to discuss this. Because this is the this is what we're finding from all the other groups, Veterans for Britain, their press officer, uh, their board are all saying the same thing, that when they go and speak to these MPs and we could list them all. And some of them I've met with and overlapped with exactly the same response. These people do not want to discuss this. They can't. They didn't. Because if, if it came out and the lid come off it in the mainstream press, in the mainstream, you know, we had 18 million Brexiteers were suddenly aware of this key factor that, you know, Brexit, what Brexit, because what's the point of this nonsense May's talking about when we don't have control of our own military and we own nothing? If there's no ownership of the military and Rolls-Royce and BAE and all the rest of it, key stuff, what, what use is Brexit? It's absolutely irrelevant. It's a dog and pony show. So okay. This, well, is, this is where we are. David, thank you for that. We'll, we'll be coming on to uh, Rolls-Royce and British Aerospace a little bit later. Uh, but another area that you told us to go and look at uh, was the Cabinet Office and the sort of people in control. Uh, we've talked about Oliver Letwin previously, who was the man running the Tory party, absolutely controlling policy. Of course, we remember that Oliver Letwin... Uh, former NM Rothschild man, but also the man who was driving privatisation of everything, privatisation of the world, I think, actually, was the title of his book. Um, uh, but you said we need to go and have a look at uh, Mr. George Freeman. So here he is uh, having a look at his Twitter page. Uh, the boast under his little picture on the left is that he's the, uh, I think it says the third ty time's nephew of Gladstone. So this man obviously thinks he is something uh, and uh, he's crowing in the uh, central text that he's delighted to have been asked by the Prime Minister to take on a new role in number 10 Cabinet Office as chair of the Prime Minister's policy board. Um, so this is where the power base is. And um, I thought I'd just have a little look through his, his Twitter account because you can pick up quite a lot. And I did pick up on this one mainly because of the headline, fake news. And what we had was a Mr. Paul Kirby, uh, that worldwide story about refugees sexually assaulting women in Frankfurt, completely made up. Now, I'm not going to delve into that story. I was just interested as to why George Freeman would retweet uh, a Paul one Kirby. So uh, I went to have a look at him. And uh, what was fascinating is that this man who is very excited they've got a computer to mimic the human brain, uh, says here that he's London School of Economics, non-executive director, Cabinet Office UK. It was a bit ambiguous there because you don't know whether he was actually just a non-executive director and involved with the Cabinet Office or a non-executive director of the Cabinet Office. Well, we did our homework, so here he is. And uh, we can tell you that he's a non-executive director at the Cabinet Office. Uh, now, we had no idea that uh, the Cabinet Office had been sort of privatised, but we're fully into directors and non-executive directors. And we thought our audience uh, would like to know a little bit more. So here we are. This is from the government's own website. So I think we can be confident they're telling the truth on this at least. And uh, we've got three uh, directors listed on that line for the Cabinet Office. The other lines are other departments, but we're only looking at the Cabinet Office here. So we've got our friend uh, Paul Kirby, uh, but we've also got this lady, Catherine Brown. Now, she's independent. This is very important to understand this. If you have a look at her background, she's been involved with RBS Bank and also the Bank of England. But she's now acting in an entirely independent, in, independent capacity. Yes. It, it is important that we understand this. 
And then we come on to the big hitters. So we've got Ian uh, Cheshire. Now, I think he was part of Kingfisher, may still be. Um, but we thought he looked an interesting chappy, totally independent. So what can we tell you about this man? Uh, well, he is fully linked into this organisation, the Prince of Wales Corporate Leaders Group. Uh, you've got a good feeling here, Mike, because these are, uh, what sort of leaders are they? Uh, well, I'll help you out on that because they're thought leaders. Well, the purple background on the text at the top gives the clue. Yeah, Prince of Wales selected uh, thought leaders, um, corporate thought leaders. is a select group of European business leaders working together under the patronage of His Royal Highness, the Prince of Wales, to advocate solutions on climate change to policymakers, business peers within the EU. This is a pro-EU, pan-EU group. Uh, is going flat out on climate change and carbon tax. Right at the heart of the Cabinet Office. Right at the heart of the Cabinet Office. Brexit is a lie. And if you have a look at the Prince of Wales Corporate Leaders Group, uh, you come to this lady, Polly Cortis. She's connected with Cambridge University. Uh, she's also connected uh, into some very interesting things, uh, including this organisation, Freshfields, Brackhouse, Derringer, um, started by... Uh, Nathan Mayer Rothschild back in 1743 and they're described as part of the quote magic circle of law firms uh, so this is a worldwide law firm that says we don't believe in any boundaries there are no nation state boundaries we just operate across the world so David I'm going to say to you I think your pointer was spot on um, it looks like the cabinet office has been fully privatised now and it's being driven by supposedly independent directors who are, of course, anything but. Quite. Uh, it looks like sort of business as usual. Um, Oliver Letwin may well have gone on the back bench, but this doesn't look anything different in terms of party control, uh, government control, number 10 control and cabinet office. So these are all the crown jewels in, in, in our government, in our interface. So you can see by all those, all those little runners where it traps out and the circles that, that are overlapping and where these people are mixing and where their ideas are coming from. And you've, you've got to default to one, one position here with all these people um, is that they really do love the money. They love the money, vested interest all over the place. Our civil service over the years uh, might not have been perfect, but we did have people who believed in public service and their loyalty to an upstanding civil service, I think, was quite high in the past. What we're now seeing is that it's there in name, but actually it doesn't exist anymore because what's happened is everything is being dr driven through these corporate interests. OK, let's uh, move on to um, NATO. Now, Lithuania. Lithuania is uh, celebrating today its 100th anniversary of the restoration of uh, Lithuania as a nation state. And they're um, celebrating, I suppose, by watching their own occupation by NATO forces. But we'll come on to that in a second. Uh, a couple of days ago, uh, Jens Stoltenberg, the Secretary General of NATO, was meeting with the uh, Lithuanian Prime Minister at uh, NATO's headquarters. Uh, and uh, he thanked Lithuania for its contributions to NATO missions uh, and its leadership on defence spending. So um, the two leaders uh, were discussing the deployment progress uh, of NATO's enhanced forward presence on the eastern part of the alliance. That means right up against the Russian border. Uh, let's look at some of that progress. So on screen at the moment, here's a train passing through Sokoka in the uh, northeastern part of uh, Poland, on the northeastern border of Poland. And we're just seeing dozens of tanks uh, on the back of... Now, there, there are also some still images on uh, local news media websites uh, showing other military equipment. This is all moving towards Lithuania through northeastern Poland. Uh, and uh, so Stoltenberg, very happy about that. He also noted uh, that NATO's deployments are defensive in nature. This is all defensive, Brian, everything that's going on there. Uh, and uh, he stressed the important of, importance of NATO's two-track approach to Russia, strong defense combined with meaningful dialogue. So there you go. That's what's going on. Uh, but in today's press conference, because yesterday we mentioned that, that uh, the defense minister's meeting is going on, in today's uh, press conference, after one of those meetings, he let this little nugget drop. Uh, he said, this is kind of a paraphrase because I was writing it down as he said it, and it was on a live stream, so I didn't get a chance to, to rewind to just 
confirm the exact wording, but this is what he said. Uh, we're going to move the NATO standing Navy into the Black Sea and carry out more regular exercises there. So, um, David, this is just continuing uh, provocation is the, the only word that we can describe it as. Yeah, I mean, we just overlap the, 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 the two things here, the financial uh, situation, both in Europe, UK and the US. Um, Trump's mandate is we're going to drop some business back for, for American people. And I think that the driver here is, of course, it's going to be it's going to be a forcing of all these other countries to increase defence spending. So whilst the countries may well increase defence spending under NATO, or under their sovereign steam, if there's any of that left, uh, will also be conjoined with uh, announcements from EU defence agency of huge defence spending. So the EU are going to be brilliant when they do that, aren't they? But the bottom line here, of course, is about spending money and buying kit. And there's only so many places they can do that. So the, the object of Trump's exercise is clearly to get revenue into his, into his till in the US and get people spending money. So it's a bit of a charade, really, and they're, they're kind of protecting, protecting, uh, pretexting and, and making Russia this huge uh, enemy and this huge problem and this, this Russia fever, Russia mania, you know, they're so evil and all the rest of it. And I'll, I'll come back to the, to the Conservative MPs in this, is that when I spoke to them, they've gone, well, if you cut, why have you cut and destroyed our military? Of course, there isn't an answer to that. They can't answer that because the answer, of course, is that they wanted to manage um, defence and defence budgets and policy and defence industry on an EU basis. And, of course, the Tory party is in favour of that. So we're going to have a real problem dealing with this because looking at the film there, it looks like the NATO is mobilising up in, up in Lithuania. Um, um, so David, just, just with you there on the screen, or just coming in the background... Um, we keep this, this simple. What, what you're saying is that basically um, NATO starts moving troops around, moving equipment around to help ramp up the Russia is, is the threat line. So you take that, you, you then lever off that, the fact that everybody's got to spend more on defence. So the EU is going to start ramping up its, its integrated EU procurement programme. And the Americans are obviously going to be out touting for business with the big boys, Boeing and Lockheed Martin. Um, so you, you are actually, uh, uh, the, you, sorry, Russia is being used as the excuse to uh, ramp up this huge increase in defence spending and merging or bringing together of the big defence contractors. Yeah, absolutely. So you're, you're seeing fake news here, in effect. You know, this mobilising is to create the fake news. Looks good, doesn't it? You know, all this stuff moving about. Okay. Um, but it's a load of nonsense because the, the, the objective is the same. You cannot get away from the objective of, of EU military union. It's, it's, it's died in the in, – in, absolutely, the die is struck from during World War II. You know, it was the concept was conceived along with that being a key part of European Union, that we would have currency union – Military union, the treasury, and then the full political state without, you know, sovereign states losing their veto. So, you know, this was aired by Avril Harriman straight out of the Bank of International Settlements. It was then aired again by Jack Delors in, uh, in the 80s with Maggie. Obviously, she said no. The Tory party have got rid of her. So we can see there very clearly that the, the controllers of the party want military union. And all of this nonsense that we're seeing is, is all a, a money game. It's a corporate game. Now, the thing is, of course, is they're not fooling Putin and the Russians. The only people they're fooling are the British people. They're not fooling Russia. Well, they, I, 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 they know exactly what the score is. You know. I, so, I emphasised this point the other day by saying that uh, if, if we take this business about how many attack submarines are operational at the moment, you can be sure the Russians know how many British attack submarines are, are operational. So the only people that don't know where the big lies being told are the British public. Um, let's just bring in uh, Trump. This is a bit of a recap because a few days ago he was tweeting out uh, saying that he was going to have a look at the uh, F-35 uh, Lockheed Martin program uh, because he, it had become too expensive. 
Um, Mike Robinson here picked up this one the other day from Pop Popular Mechanics that it was the headline. This is actually fake news that the F-35 scores impressive 15 to 1 kill ratio. But when we read the article, the truth was that it could only do that as a fighter when it had another fighter, the F-22, there to protect it. So this is Alice in Wonderland stuff. We've bought this piece of kit, but whether it's going to work or not. And then we've got, as you say, Trump now saying that uh, NATO members have got to pay their full and proper contributions to the alliance. And many of them are not even done so. This was reported back on the 6th of February. And uh, they're now heading in that direction. Well, indeed, because as we mentioned yesterday, the defence minister's meeting is taking place uh, at NATO. Uh, and, uh, well, Stoltenberg uh, gave a press conference. He was very happy about things. He said he welcomed the clear message from Secretary Mattis on the importance of the transatlantic partnership and the message from all the other allies that we need to strengthen the alliance in times of turmoil. So what was it Mattis actually said? He said the alliance remains a fundamental bedrock for the United States and for all the transatlantic community, bonded as we are together. Uh, but he said that uh, it's absolutely appropriate, uh, as a European Minister of Defence said last week, it's a fair demand that all who benefit from the best defence in the world carry their proportionate share of the necessary cost to defend freedom. And we should never forget, ultimately, it is freedom that we defend here at NATO. And I do have confidence that we will prove once again uh, that we can react to the changing cir circumstances. We've done so in the past. There's every reason for confidence that we will move out purposefully, purposefully once together once again. So they are demanding more money. Now, one of the things that uh, Stoltenberg made absolutely clear in his uh, press conferences uh, was that uh, this has been absolutely at the heart of his policy as Secretary of General of NATO from the time he took the job, which That's is to says. increase spending on NATO defence. He wants more money for NATO. Um, and as we pointed out yesterday, uh, there's other stuff going, going on around the sidelines. Today they were having their uh, uh, meeting on Georgia. Uh, that's going on. Uh, and they're very keen to make sure that Georgia uh, is brought into NATO. We mentioned this yesterday. This is pretty significant in terms of how Russia is going to feel about encirclement. But as I said yesterday, we don't have to worry about it because uh, NATO has a new Frequently Asked Questions document which says that there is no encirclement going on because, uh, of course, uh, they're only encircling uh, a quarter of the circle in the west and the south. Uh, and we don't, we, you know, there's all this other Russian border that, uh, that, they're, not, that they're nowhere near. So that works fine. Um, Stoltenberg said, defense is not just about what we do at home. It's, much, it's as much about what happens beyond our borders. So this seems to go against what uh, uh, was being said when Theresa May was visiting Trump. Uh, when she was suggesting that we weren't going to worry too much about what's going on outside our own borders in the future. Uh, this doesn't quite seem to add up. Um, and as I say, other things going on, UK, Canada, Poland, Lithuania and the US all offering their support for Ukraine because we're going to uh, ramp up the Ukraine. Uh, and also um, Fallon was meeting the Pol his Polish counterpart uh, because the UK will be deploying in Poland this year a whole company of soldiers to increase NATO's deterrence there. So um, we're doing well. Troop movements, equipment, arms, tanks, all moving. Right. So here's one for David. Let's talk about uh, Operation Bison Dravsko uh, in Poland 2017. This is an exercise. Came to an end today. Uh, with uh, They actually finished their closing ceremony yesterday with a fire power demonstration. Uh, the demonstration, they say, provides a clear picture of the complexity of joint combined operations in a multinational brigade context. During the exercise, together we stand uh, and together we shield. Therefore, together we trained. So that's really good. Uh, the fire part demonstration was apparently attended by VIPs from the participating countries. Uh, and this uh, exercise ran from the 11th of January to the 24th of February. Uh, sorry, it is running till the 24th of February. Uh, a multinational exercise, 5,000 soldiers, six different NATO countries, uh, and uh, as I say, the tagline is together we stand, together we shield. Um, so they've got German leopard tanks, Polish battle tanks, uh, German boxers and Polish uh, armoured per personnel, character, uh, personnel armor carriers, car carriers. Uh, Dutch equipment. No, but the main players in this, David, are the Dutch and the Germans. So there's 5,000 personnel, 3,500 of them are, are Dutch. 
But the key point here is that it's Dutch and German armed forces deepening their integration. That's what this exercise is about. And I think it was about a year ago that we mentioned first uh, that the way that this military integration seems to be happening uh, is that the French and the British have teamed up with their 50-year defence pact, that the Dutch and the Germans are running a similar operation. Uh, and uh, about a year ago, we mentioned that they were integrating the Dutch and the German navies, uh, that they were integrating with armoured cooperate, uh, cooperation, joint air defence, and so on, and that they had been signing agreements along those lines. So what we have here, David, is uh, an, op, uh, an exercise, uh, a training exercise, where we're seeing that integration being tested. Yeah, th th this is principally to make um, all the senior and middle-ranking officers uh, present and past in the UK feel comfortable. And the reason that they're doing that under the NATO banner, so there's a lot of NATO news, a lot of NATO Stolenberg stuff and, you know, all this kind of, we keep hearing NATO, NATO, NATO. That's to make our officers feel comfortable because that's what they know and they, they're OK with that. So it's almost as if to sort of make them sit back on their heels and, and get cosy. What the reality is, of course, is that behind the scenes, all of the activation for the EU military union program and the EU C3s is taking a place at maximum throttle. All this stuff about NATO is a pure cover just to keep our old guard quiet and the general public quiet. So the, all the stuff that's already going on, and we already know because we've got admirals whistleblowing, that all the stuff with NATO in the Aegean is actually EU and it's being done as the a and the NATO are taking the role on as an agency under a NATO flag so everybody's comfortable and it doesn't alert anyone to actually what's really going on that this is full on EU military union taking place while we're looking at it so uh one thing that's you know that's very apparent here of course is that it's taking all the all the wind out of the challenging and out of the arguing and you can't get away from the fact that uh every time we see any photo shoots taking place, Frederica Mogherini and an EU flag is always there. So, you know, it's alert code five, everyone, defence condition one. We've got to now all, you know, from lance corporals, sergeants, um, captains and commanders, and everyone has got to close ranks now. If you know somebody that's in the military, they have got to be alerted that this is a dog and pony show. They're using NATO to do a, literally a sort of bedspread cover on what's really going on because they are not going to stop. They are going to go for full EU military union before we start the Brexit negotiations properly or even exit or whatever, because it's an utter nonsense what's taking place. OK, thank you for that. And let's uh, just delve into the uh, background of these big defence companies and the procurement issues. Now, Mike had this uh, slide up on screen a couple of days ago with Rolls-Royce. Uh, was it four billion? 4.6 billion Four, loss. 4.6 billion loss. A little bit of fraud going on, but don't worry about that. So Rolls-Royce, very vulnerable. Uh, you're saying, David, that uh, British aerospace is also looking very vulnerable to the Americans because, of course, there are no orders going in, no proper orders going in uh, for British defence equipment. So no money's flowing through to British aerospace. They're having to go flat out for those overseas Saudi contracts and whatever. But uh, let's take a look at the defence estate. Uh, this is Devonport Dockyard. Now, this, this is a vast military um, Complex. Uh, complex, thank you, that's the word. 365 hectares of Devonport Naval Base. It goes off the screen at the top of your picture there. We can get it all in. Um, now, this is the biggest naval base in Europe, and effectively, if you see it, it's empty. There's nothing there. There's no aircraft carriers. There's no ships. There's no submarines. Uh, this is a historic photograph, but it's empty. It's a massive, empty naval base despite the fact it has superb infrastructure, huge dry docks and basins for ships, uh, for, for all the sort of work that has to, has to be conducted. Workforce uh, dropped well under 5,000. And of course, all of the supporting skill base has been decimated. So around um, the area, in fact, we've got the UK Column Studio, it used to be factories here. Many of them spin-offs of what was going on in the dockyard, all of that gone in Plymouth. And of course, we have to remember that the base itself was sold off to private interest by John Major, 
So more treason by the Conservative Party. So public infrastructure simply given away. And how ba bad is it? Well, this dockyard used to build warships. Last one built a frigate, HMS Scylla, in 1968. And locally, we've also got the Britannia Royal Navy College. This is where the officers for the Royal Navy trained. Uh, we're getting some very interesting information out of the college. Uh, people talking about breakdown. Um, people saying the only thing keeping it going are the foreign students. So overseas navies coming in to be trained. Otherwise, why do we need to be training people? Because we don't have the ships. And uh, many people are saying that there's already developers looking at the college uh, because it's got spectacular views for flats. Uh, well, that could well be a possibility. Um, what's your comments uh, on this, David? We, we are seeing really that whilst the European system is being ramped up, excuse me, <clears throat> uh, we're seeing British defence infrastructure just given away. Yeah, quite. Along with the, you know, capital assets that have been cut up, destroyed, scraps like our uh, three deck cruisers, carriers given away for 10 pence to America. Um, they're also giving away the the sites, the dockyards, the bases, so on and so forth. So whilst the good people of this um, this nation and Devon and probably uh, more, more so than others uh, have had much blood, sweat and tears invested in UK defence, they can all go down to Plymouth Hoe now and go, they see no ships. And there's a reason for that. And it's called EU military union. Yep. But the decisions, of course, the decisions for the Royal Navy to be pulled all out of Devon were taken 20 years ago. But I don't suppose that the MPs down there, Mr. Streeter, Mr. Coville and uh, Mrs. Trevelyan there in Dartmouth uh, are, are debating or talking about this issue to any of their electorate or constituents, are they? Um, for they dare not. Uh, I suppose the good people of Dartmouth, if they knew that the, uh, that, that Naval College was going to shut along with the rest of it and go up to Faz Lane, then they perhaps have something to say and would vote for somebody else, wouldn't they? Uh, David, thank you for reminding me of that, because, of course, this is the subtlety, isn't it? All of these training facilities, we're told, just to do with submarines going north, north of the border. But in fact, we know what's to follow. Uh, it's basically England is being hollowed out in this policy. But uh, what are our local MPs talking about? Well, let's bring on Mr Colville, uh, because Centre, uh, the Herald here, picked up the fact he was made a parliamentary undersecretary to, I think, the Defence Committee. So um, Oliver Colville circled. I had a job getting that circle around him because I think he's been eating too many fish, but we'll come on to that. Uh, he was given a job. Uh, but he's not reporting on defence at all. He's silent. He's talking about hedgehogs. I think he's been involved with seagulls, Mike. Yeah, yeah. He's big on hedgehogs. He's big on seagulls. But on the right of your screen, he's getting very excited because um, Plymouth's fishing port could well be developed uh, in a detrimental way. So he's getting the photo shoot in there. Uh, you mean there'll be more fishing and, and more fish landed? Is that what you mean? Uh, no, I think there'll be more flats. Ah. And... Uh, apartments for those listening overseas. Um, so there we are. That's what our local MPs are talking about. And um, we'll just add in here on the subject of fishing. Uh, there are some people picking up now that, of course, we're talking Brexit, but nothing is being done to restore Brit Britain's fishing industry. And on the basis of um, when people are doing the right thing, we should be praising them. This is a document taken from Conservatives for Liberty bit of an oxymoron at the moment, but we hope people are waking up. But a very good article, which is actually talking about the immense damage that the Europe, <clears throat> European Union has done to Britain's fishing industry and what needs to happen if we're to store it, uh, restore the industry, um, if Theresa May's Brexit is for real. Mm. So that's, uh, that's interesting stuff. And uh, David, just finally, can you give us any updates on your submission into the Defence Committee. That's up on the UK Column website, uh, evidence into the Defence Committee. Have you had any further response or is that a wall of silence as well? Well, there's been, there's, there's been a reasonable amount of response, but I think that the, 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 big, the fundamental problem here is, is, is we've just got to get a common a frame established from the senior officers. The senior officers have got to you know, properly stop sort of obfuscating too many of them are not getting engaged properly on this and get a common a, a common view of what the battlefield actually is in order that we can stabilize it and go forward 
So that's that's the first thing. And I think there's a lot of assumptions. I've got one or two chiefs of defence staff saying, well, I'm sure David Davis is on top of this. Um, well, I'm um, frankly, um, whether he is or isn't, you know, is is dangerous because the assumptions are, are not founded currently on what Mr. Fallon is doing and not doing more in particular and his silence by consent and increasing money into the European Defence Agency. So we're seeing shutting here in the UK and more, you know, more money going into EU. So we can see his position. Uh, but I think fundamentally here, a lot of the sort of strategic forecasting that we put into that paper and the other stuff that's up on the UK side uh, is coming to fruition. Um, you know, there's going to be some more stuff to come. Um, um, we're looking currently at really, realistically what this F-35 debacle is going to be with the, you know, maybe the Americans all wake up and realise how they've been stitched up by um, some of the UK interests here with the F-35 uh, in lieu of trading money off Trident. So the guys at Lockheed um, need to sort of wake up and smell the coffee because their stocks took a hammering over this. And they've got to think, you know, was it more to do with some factions in the MOD trying to trade? money off Trident by the input that we were giving on F-35 and how that was being delayed and obfuscated uh, and from what I'm reliably informed by a senior officer was deliberate. Uh, David, that's a very interesting subject and I think we're going to have to revisit that. Have we time for one last one on Syria, Mike? Yes, we do. Yes, this is a, a good piece of news actually, although it is in Sputnik and of course in this post-truth world it's always dangerous to, to promote Sputnik because we might be considered as uh, being Putin sympathisers or something. But anyway, here we are. Uh, amnesty report on Syrian prison deaths questioned by ex-UK ambassador to Syria. So this is the former ambassador to Syria, Peter Ford, uh, speaking to Sputnik, uh, scathingly attacking Amnesty for saying that uh, the, Assad, uh, the Assad government had carried out uh, allegedly the hangings of 13,000 prisoners. Uh, he said that this was sensationalist. He said it was total fabrication. Uh, they used, you know, that they were using this type of uh, uh, nonsense to justify the Iraq war. Uh, and he said that uh, Amnesty International is the vanguard of liberal interventionism. They have become part of the liberal elite establishment. This is a new way of picking up uh, the white man's burden. You go around changing regimes you accuse of human rights abuses. Um, I would just add, while committing them yourself, of course. Um, so um, do have a look at that Sputnik article and have a look to see what, uh, what he had to say. OK, right, David, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, and as I say, we will have a look at that issue of the uh, F-35 and possible um, deal, backdoor deals with the uh, Ministry of Defence. Uh, that brings us to the end of today's news. We will be back same time tomorrow with David Scott, Northern Exposure and some reports from north of the border. Thanks very much for joining us. If you're not a subscriber, please sign on and subscribe because we can only do what we do with your help. Thanks very much. Bye-bye.